Communications Office at the Bangalore Life Science Cluster. And what we have today is a very special double feature of our monthly science cafe. So we've had, uh, so we've had, you can't hear me. It's on, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we have our monthly science cafes at different venues in the city. This is, uh, I think, our 18th and 19th kind of. So, uh, it's on. Okay. It is on, yeah. So, uh, what we do is we have researchers from the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, which is uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine and the Center for Cellul uh, Cellular and Molecular Platforms. So these three institu institutes form the Bangalore Life Science Cluster which is located in Sahagar Nagar. If anyone heads that side, come drop by. Okay, and um, what we have today is a special double feature. So we have uh, Dr. Shrikala Raghavan <laughs> okay. and uh, we have Dr. Shannon Wilson. And Dr. Shrikala is a uh, cell biologist who works on skin stem cells and uh, how they provide us immunity. So she'll be doing the first session and then we'll have Dr. Shannon Olson after that. So I will tell you about Dr. Shannon afterwards. Okay? And uh, I hope you enjoy the session. Please attend our events in the future and you can register at the back. extremely informal talk, so please feel free uh, to stop me anytime, any questions. Um, it's just an informal chat about the kinds of work that we do, but also I hope at the end of this talk today, you'll know more about your skin than you ever thought you would know. So without getting, uh, so then without further ado, let me just start off with my first slide. And this was taken from an exhibition called Bodies, which traveled the world and it's still traveling the world. And essentially what this shows you is this uh, man, I mean this, this body holding onto his skin. And just to reflect the fact that the skin is really truly our largest organ. I don't know if many of you think about skin as an organ, but it is an organ, and it is our largest organ. And it is what protects us from our external environment. And it does, this in multiple ways, and I'm going to uh, go through that in my talk today. And it's just a remarkable organ. So when we just go back and look at what the skin is, um, it is this structure that has on its very external surface this layer of cells called the epidermis. And uh, this is the part of the skin that's constant, constantly replenishing. So it replenishes every three weeks. And below that, we have a structure called the dermis. And uh, this is, doesn't replenish as much, but it's actually also a very, very important part of our skin. And in addition to the epidermis and the dermis, we have uh, multiple appendages. And this is what we call appendages. And these include things like the hair follicle, which all of you are familiar with. This is where your hair comes out of. Then you have something called the sebaceous gland. This is what produces an oily substance called sebum. So if you feel your skin is oily, this is because your sebaceous gland is producing the sebum. This is also protective for the skin. And most importantly, we have something called the sweat gland. And this is concentrated in different parts of our body. But the, the job of the sweat gland is to produce water and release water and then essentially cause cooling. So it allows for the thermoregulation of our body. And so this extremely complex structure arises in development as a very simple single layer structure and eventually gets patterned and forms in this way. And so if you actually go back to the part of the skin which is the epidermis which is constantly being turned over as I said. So we actually lose a million of our cells a day. Okay, this is how quickly we're turning this over. But we never do run out of skin, right? We never ever have a, um, a, a situation under normal circumstances where you actually run out of your skin. 
And that's because the skin has tremendous numbers of stem cells, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later in this talk. And the regulation of these cells is what helps to continue uh, this, this proliferative um, process, which keeps the skin in its condition. And so within this epidermal layer, uh, you have only one layer of cells that divide. And so these cells out here, these are called the basal cells. These are the only cells that are dividing. And then everything after that stops dividing. And eventually, you have a layer of cells right on top of the skin. And if ever you know you have dry skin and you see that whitish stuff on your skin, that's really your skin that's sloughing off. But don't worry, there's plenty that's taking its place. And so this track that goes from the basal layer to the outermost layer of the skin takes about three weeks. And it's constantly happening throughout your lifetime. What's remarkable is that this epidermis that I was telling you about is only about as thin as saran wrap. That's it. That is what is protecting you from your external environment. And so it is the hero of our story because this is what keeps not just the moisture, so we're 70% water, it's not just what keeps the moisture inside, but it also works extremely hard to make sure that external agents like bacteria, viruses, and other things don't enter our skin. And if they do enter our skin, we have additional mechanisms to take care of it. So today I'm going to take you through some of these mechanisms and also pepper in some of the work that we're doing in my laboratory at uh, INSTEM in Bangalore. So when we think about the organization of the skin, what's very interesting is, uh, which you may or may not know, is that the skin is one of the last organs to develop. And the thought is that mammals, like us, uh, develop in an amniotic fluid, right? We develop in a watery environment. And so the idea is that we actually don't need the skin until very, very late in gestation. And so, in fact, in human terms, the skin only develops in the third trimester. When I say develops, it actually acquires uh, the ability for the fetus or the baby to survive outside the womb only after the third trimester. Now, if you happen to be born prematurely, and many of you might have heard of examples of premature babies, there are two organs uh, that don't develop. One is your skin and one is your lungs. So both of these organs are really not required when you're in utero. And so that's part of the reason why babies are kept in incubators. Uh, because they don't have the ability to regulate their body temperature, they don't have the ability to sweat properly, and so they're kept in this protected environment where they're kept at the right uh, moisture and the right temperature. And so this is just, the next slide just illustrates what I'm talking about, which is the development of the skin. So we in our lab use the mouse as a model system, and the beauty of using the system is that it has incredible similarities between the human, to the human skin. Not only in terms of its structures, but also in terms of many of the genes that are important in setting up this organ. And so, and of course, what's advantageous about using a model system like the mouse is that the total development takes only about 20 days. And so from the time you start thinking about a problem to the time you actually get the mouse, at least as long as you have the correct model, is about 20 days. Human gestation takes nine months, and of course, nobody can, uh, we, can, we don't really do research on humans. And so this is just to show you that this, what we call a terminal barrier, this is what allows an animal to live outside. Because as long as the skin is not able to protect itself uh, from the external environment, you can't really live outside the womb. And so this blue dye is a dye that will penetrate skin that doesn't have this terminal barrier that's been acquired. So about three and a half days before an animal is born, it has no protection. And so if you were to again go back and uh, uh, sort of uh, think in terms of human gestation, we're talking about literally the start of your third trimester. And then about two and a half days before birth, you start acquiring this barrier at the back of the animal and then slowly you acquire more of it. And eventually, just about a day before this animal is going to be born, 
it acquires a complete barrier, and at this stage, it can actually be born and live outside. So, in, in terms of today's talk, I'm going to cover three different aspects with respect to skin biology. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is skin pigmentation or skin color. And I'm going to talk about both in terms of animal skin color and what the primary use of that is, but also of human skin color and where that arises from. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about is a protective mechanism that skin has developed by employing something called our immune system to protect us from the external environment. And I'm going to talk to you about how these immune cells are essentially the frontline soldiers in our body that help us uh, uh, protect, uh, that protects our body, as I said, from the external environment. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about stem cells. I'm sure everyone in this room has heard about stem cells. And um, essentially, this is sort of probably one of the most promising areas um, of research that has, is happening in our field and certainly in all other fields. And I'm going to tell you some of the latest work both through our lab and some of the other labs in this area. Okay, so without further ado, so when we talk about uh, skin color, so when you go around and look at any number of animals, or any, any animal that you've seen, whether it's the zebra, whether it's a leopard with its spots, whether it's a red tree frog, or whether it's a fish that's in uh, its environment, what you can appreciate is the panoply of colors that you see in these animals. And all of these colors are provided by the skin of that animal. And in terms of the animal kingdom, of course, one of the main purposes of acquiring this type of color for the animals is camouflage. And so I'm showing you two examples of camouflage here. And on the left side is this leaf-tailed gecko. And you can imagine why it actually acquires this color, because it basically lives on the floor of the forest. And you can't make it apart from the surrounding dead leaves, right? They look exactly like its environment. And so it's a protective mechanism for this animal. And the, on the right is a tiger in the savanna. And the reason it has these stripes is because it's going around tall grasses. And so when it is walking around, it is, uh, it is in, in some sense invisible to its prey. And it can quietly sort of paddle around in, in this environment. And so the skin coloration, at least in terms of animal, the animal kingdom, has evolved really as a protective mechanism, as a camouflage mechanism. In this, we also have um, this incredible art of mimicry, where you have animals that are not dangerous, mimicking animals that look dangerous. And I'm sure you've also heard of examples such as this. But perhaps the most stunning example, as far as um, I can tell, of camouflage is the cephalopods. You know, cephalopods include opt octopus and squids, and these animals have this incredible ability to change not only their color, but completely camouflage themselves in their environment. And I actually have a movie to show you what I mean by that. And what you can see is this octopus sort of swimming around, and then it will flash its color, it will turn dark, because it's sort of giving a warning signal, and then it eventually settles down on this little pile of mud, and it converts its color not only to look like the sand that it's around, but also gets the bumps uh, to make it look like its environment. And so if a predator was happily swimming along on top of it, it's not going to be able to see this dude. And that's pretty amazing. We still don't understand how it does this. This is an active area of investigation. You can imagine, the cephalopods have a tremendous brain. And so clearly, they're able to understand the environment, they're able to react to the environment, they're able to match color better than any of us can. We still don't know how they do this. But just in terms of how they are able to, sorry, is there a question? So, um, 
And just in terms of how they do this, uh, they have these cells in their skin called chromatophores. And they come in various colors. They go all the way from a very light color to the very dark color, so sort of black and all the way to sort of reds and yellows. And each of these cells can be independently controlled. And so if you look at this, you can see that each of them can flash, and each of them can grow big, or each of them can grow small. And they do that because they have a bunch of muscles surrounding each of these cells. And so when one color expands, it becomes like a brown color, then if the white expands, or if they become really small, it becomes sort of more whitish or colorless. And so by just adjusting these chromatophores, they're able to adjust the color on their, uh, of their skin. Um, however, in mammals, and uh, particularly humans, skin color is, uh, is determined by this pigment called melanin. And I'm sure you might have all heard about this. And so melanin is a pigment that is made by cells in our skin known as melanocytes. These cells, the melanocytes, actually originate from something called the neural crest. So this is what also gives rise to your brain. Now these cells will produce two types of colors. Uh, they will produce a lighter color called eumelanin, and these colors are essentially, I'm sorry, they produce a darker color called eumelanin, which is either browns and blacks. And they also produce another uh, color called the fumelanin, which is more pinkish and red. And this is just the structure of the melanocyte. So essentially it's a cell that has these long processes, and it will now produce these melanin granules that will now be put into the skin. So this is actually, to me, as a skin biologist and as a skin researcher, one of the most important parts of, uh, uh, of today's talk, which is essentially the only difference between us is the amount of melanin pigment we carry. Fundamentally, our skin is exactly the same. Whether you're fair-skinned, or whether you're dark skinned, it doesn't matter. Your skin is exactly the same. The only difference is the amount of melanin pigment you carry. And so in terms of, if you go back and look at human skin color, the range of skin colors where you go from the palest to the darkest depends just on whether you're producing eumelanin or fumelanin, as well as a number of melanin granules you're putting out into your skin. And there's a very specific reason why your skin color is the color it is. And that has to do with where we evolved from. So as you may know, we actually evolved, our ancestors evolved in the plains of Africa, which is in the equatorial region of the world. So when we evolved, and we were sort of dwelling on the savannas, and so when you were exposed to direct sunlight, as a protective mechanism, you put out a lot of melanin, really to protect yourself from the UV rays of the sun. And as sapiens migrated to other parts of the globe, into the northern uh, parts of the globe, so, so essentially, this is just a map of the color coloration, um, color distribution in the world. And what you can see is, in the equatorial and the tropical regions, you find the darkest skin colors, and that's because you're exposed to the most amount of direct sunlight. And as you go to the temperate regions, the color lightens. The reason for that is, of course, you're not exposed to direct sunlight, so you don't have to put in as much protective mechanism uh, out in your skin. And so this has evolved over the last 100,000 years or so to, to, uh, for, for this kind of coloration. And fundamentally, this is just a protective mechanism. So therefore, people like us, who do have a darker skin tone, are completely protected from skin cancer because we are protected from the direct harm of the UV rays. And so, love your skin. Love the skin that you're in, always. I mean, look for a second. Yeah. <coughs> this, uh, suppose the blacks who are evolved from the African countries, even generations after they stay, stay I mean, staying in the uh, Western place, I mean, uh, in America or somewhere, even after generations, their color continues to be black. Yes. Why? What is the reason? Yes, because they have actually fixed in their population the genes that are important for the production of the eumelanin, right? 
And so, what, but what has happened is if you actually go and look at the population that is arising from the plains of Africa and the populations, and, and remember that they have only been brought to, um, the, uh, to the European countries in America in the past 300, 400 years. And so we haven't had enough time for them to adapt their skin color. If you give them enough time, they will probably will adapt to the colder climes and they will start losing their pigment. But they have been transplanted from where they were to a new, uh, to a new environment. And so not enough time has passed for this to happen genetically. But certainly, I think, as people have as the races have mixed, there have been much more variation. And so, um, the second thing I'm going to talk to you about is the immune system of the skin. Now, you may or may not know this, but you know the skin is chock full of immune cells. And one way to um, really, I'm sure each of you have probably un, um, have an experience with this, where you know if you're getting tested for allergies. How many of you have gotten tested for allergies? Yeah? What do they do? They inject something under your skin, right? And then you get a reaction, right? What is that reaction? That reaction is nothing but a reaction of your immune cells. Okay? And so then you will know, are you actually creating a response to the allergen that was there? And if, what kind of a reaction that is? And so, the, uh, the, the immune system of the skin is quite complicated, and I'm not, I'm not going to give you too many details about it, except to say that it can, there's a wide variety of cells that are involved. And since the primary role of the skin is defense, right, it has to defend against any invaders. And so the way it does that, it has these pool of cells which are called neutrophils and macrophages, so these guys here. And their job is to really go after any invading pathogen. And so I'm just going to give you an example of how quickly this can happen. Before that, I'm just going to give you sort of what happens. And this is something that all of you have faced at some point or the other. You get a little bit of a wound, right? You get a little bit of a scratch. Uh, depending on how deep it is, right? You, you bleed for some time. The bleeding stops. Then you have a little bit of a scar. Forming, and eventually the skull falls off, right? And you just see something that's happening on the top. It's like, oh, this is, no, oh, this is not good. Oh no, this has happened. And then you try to put a bandaid on it, make sure that nothing much happens to it, depending again on the size of your wound. But underneath that wound, there is a village that is taking care of you, and this village is your immune system. So as soon as you get injured, which is this first step. Uh, you can bet your life that bacteria and viruses are going to enter your skin. Okay, because otherwise it's sort of a sterile environment. This is going to happen right away. The minute this happens, you have sort of blood vessels. You also have cells within the skin itself, but you also have cells in the blood vessels that are supplying your skin. And these guys will notice that there is a wound and that there are bacteria that have been, that have been introduced. And they're going to go rushing in and take care of it. The minute, and so that's literally within the first hour that you're injured. Subsequently, the cells surrounding the wound will start dividing and then will work, work, work its way towards the center of the wound. And then your wound will close. And so this is just a movie. I just love this movie because it just shows you how quickly the response time is. So this is where the wound has happened, okay? And these green cells are cells called neutrophils. Their job is to chase bacteria, okay? So they have this wound has happened, and they're just rushing in to help you take care of this wound. And the time below, the timestamp below, is an hour and nine minutes. So within an hour and nine minutes of you being wounded, or, or this, this animal being wounded, the cells have just gone in, and honed in to the fact that there is a wound over there. <coughs> now I told you that these, the guys that go in first are these cells called neutrophils. And this again is one of my favorite movies. 
So these are red blood cells. These are, we know that because they don't have nuclei in them. And then this guy is a neutrophil. And this poor little creature here is a bacteria. And what you can see is this guy is like a heat-seeking missile. It'll keep chasing this bacteria around and around and around till it catches it. Okay, so just enjoy watching this. This is what our immune system is doing for us on a daily basis. And it doesn't matter where the bacteria goes, the cell just turns. Till it eventually catches it, and bye-bye bacteria. Okay. And then it's like, okay, where's the next guy I can go after? And so this is what your immune system is doing under your skin. It's going after <coughs> these kind of pathogens and making sure that you are protected from sort of mass infection. Of course, sometimes um, you can get a very heavy dose of bacteria. And when that happens, you do need the help of antibiotics. But by and large, your body is perfectly capable of taking care of itself. And so, if you do take antibiotics, it should be because your doctor has told you to take it, because your infection is actually very strong in it. And, and when you do take it, you need to take it for a long enough time. So that your bacteria, the bacteria against which you're taking antibiotics, uh, you don't actually develop resistance to it. Okay? They, so that if you develop resistance to it, or if you have a resistant strain, and it becomes very difficult to treat your infection. And so, once all of these cool cells come and take care of all the invaders, the bacteria, what happens then is that you actually have uh, the, this wound that starts healing. As I said, the cells, the surrounding cells will come in and close up the wound. And then it'll produce what is called a matrix. So it just puts in this sort of matrix or plug that is over there. And very often, depending on the type of wound that we have, we then are left with a memory of a wound, which is essentially a scar. So this is because whatever plug that we've kept there, and this is because this is caused by this whole immune reaction, because it's now activating the cells to produce this uh, material, essentially this doesn't get resolved for us. And so eventually we are left with a scar of where the wound was. It's almost like a memory of the wound that we had. But that's okay. We can look at that because this is telling us that our immune system is actually working quite well. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to ask about uh, our hands, right? Are, are our hands healing faster than other parts of our body if we get injured? For instance, uh, if you get pricked by uh, a thorn on your finger, right? Sometimes the thorn breaks off and it gets stuck in there and within like 20 minutes, you're not able to like actually reach where the thorn is to pull it out. So is it faster in your hands or are there parts of your body that do that faster? That's a good question. So what's interesting is, even though we have the same type of skin, the skin on our palms and the skin on the soles of our feet, which is called palmer and plantar skin, is the thickest. It's very, very thick. It's 10 times thicker than the skin anywhere else. And when I say thick, it's the outer layer that keeps getting sloughed off, mm -hmm. that actually um, is, um, uh, that, that's the layer that's actually expanded uh, in our palms. And it's really a leftover of us being on force and then becoming upright, right? And so when we walk on our feet, we need protection to dampen uh, the, the forces that are coming from the earth. And so that's part of the reason why we have the thickest possible skin there. And so yes, so certainly the thorn, I mean, you have to get a really deep and sharp cut for you to bleed, but that also heals much faster, mm -hmm. definitely on your, on your palms, than say on your face, which has very thin and delicate skin. So one of the things that we are very interested in understanding our lab is that this immune system that I talked to you about is really fantastic when it comes to you know protecting us from bacterial viruses and other uh, and other uh, organisms. However, sometimes this very same immune system that is supposed to protect us can turn on us. Okay, and when it turns on us, this is this gives rise to a disease called an autoimmune disease. And I'm sure, again, all of you must have heard about it, or at least types of autoimmune diseases. 
And again, we do not really understand why that is. We're trying to, scientists are trying to understand what the genesis of autoimmune disease is. Why would a body turn on itself? Because it has really devastating consequences. So this is just a small list of all the autoimmune diseases. It affects every organ, it affects every tissue, it affects every cell type. And depending on where the uh, attack is happening, it can have really devastating consequences. And so we are, as scientists, trying to understand why this is happening and why the immune system is fighting off against us. But certainly in terms of skin, since this is what I'm talking to you about, um, a more sort of common um, autoimmune disease is a disease called vitiligo. And vitiligo is the loss of pigmentation. And this is essentially, the reason this happens is that your immune cells are fighting against the melanocytes. The melanocytes that are producing your melanin pigment. And that is actually then, these cells are dying. And when they die, they're no longer producing the pigment. And this happens sort of in a patchy manner. And so there are parts that don't have this attack, and there are parts that have this attack. And scientists are still trying to understand why that might be. But probably the most common form of autoimmune disease, again, which you all must have heard about, is rheumatoid arthritis, right? I'm sure everybody of you know, knows somebody that has RA. And the confounding thing about a disease like RA is that the inflammation that happens because you're having this disease causes damage. And this damage then gives rise to more inflammation. And so this becomes this vicious cycle of damage and disease and damage and disease. And so very often, the first time you even know that you have RA is joint pain. By that time, it's already a lot of damage has been done. So we don't actually, uh, we don't know why the body again starts fighting against the joints, but this is something that sort of becomes this vicious cycle. So in my lab at INSTEM, we developed a mouse model uh, to understand, not RA, but to understand this genesis of this immune response against self, right? So we were able to develop this mouse model where in the normal mouse, and these green cells here are your immune cells. So they're just labeled with a green antibody. And so normally you don't have too many of these cells. But then in the mod model that we developed, we get a lot of these cells coming in. And what happens is that this red part, which you can see just underneath the green cells, it starts breaking up, it starts breaking apart, okay? This is just really a reflection of the damage that these immune cells are doing. And so we, when we got this model, this was really exciting for us because this was happening as the animal was developing embryogenesis. So this was the earliest possible time in which we could actually detect this uh, defect or the, this sort of problem within the animal. So we were able to go back in time and ask, okay, why does it start? And we were able to come up with a mechanism of why it starts. And we were also able to find ways of treating it. And so this was work that we published a couple of years ago. But essentially, we, were, we now have in our lab this model that allows us to understand the very earliest events that set up, sets up this vicious cycle. And we have a mechanism of testing various drugs to see which drug can actually help mitigate or help uh, sort of stop this kind of uh, tissue damage in its tracks. And hopefully, by using this model, we'll be able to understand chronic inflammation and how and come up with better treatment paradigms. And so, the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk to you about stem cells. So, how many of you have heard about stem cells? Does anyone want to venture a definition of a stem cell? Yes? Or what do you think as, as a, you know, what comes to mind when you think of a stem cell? Regeneration. Very good. Regeneration. For you, the placenta is the main stem cell. There, is, there are stem cells in the placenta. Very good. There's stem cells in the umbilical cord for the baby that people can use because those are, when you talk about cord blood, 
You know, there's been the ways of, you know, there's been a move now to save the cord blood of your baby so that it might be needed later on. What else? Increase life lifespan. Lifespan, increase lifespan, sure. Potential. 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 Very good. So a stem cell is really a cell for um, a lot of diseases. Yes. So it is responsible for a lot of diseases or is a cure for a lot of diseases, right? Very good. So I think all of you have some idea of stem cells. So stem cells very simply is a cell that can either give rise to itself or can give rise to a progeny. Okay? So essentially by in that way it's immortal. As long as you're living, a cell that divides and gives rise to itself or gives rise to a progeny or a daughter cell. Okay? And so either it can divide in a symmetric way, meaning a stem cell gives rise to two daughter stem cells or what we call asymmetrically, which is gives rise to one stem cell and one daughter cell. But a stem cell will always give rise to another stem cell. That is your source. That is your elixir of life, right? You always have to have a stem cell giving rise to another stem cell. So you can imagine the tissue like the skin that I told you turns over every three weeks. It has to have a really fantastic pool of stem cells. And so we, as uh, skin stem cell biologists, have been actually trying to understand um, where these stem cells exist. And it turns out the skin is nothing but a bag of stem cells. There are stem cells everywhere you look in the skin. Okay? So there are stem cells within the top layer, so the epidermis that I told you about, that turns over every three weeks. There are stem cells in these hair follicles that I talked to you about. So these hair follicles have stem cells, but these stem cells turn out to be a little bit different from the stem cells that are there in the epithelium. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to understand these various pools of stem cells. And in fact, what happens with the cells that are in the hair follicle, so these cells, which are here in the hair follicles, these guys are what we call slow cycling cells. How do we know that they're slow cycling? You can actually label the DNA of these cells and ask whether these cells divide or not. So if you've labeled the DNA of the cell and the cell doesn't divide, it still retains its label. And that's exactly what we see over here. So these green cells over here are your stem cells in, your, in the skin. And these cells actually cycle extremely slowly. So the question that we wanted to ask in my lab is, what is it that keeps these stem cells quiet? Why are they so quiet? Right? And so, of course, this is not work that's done only in my lab. Several labs have been looking at it. And what we do know is that there are factors that are expressed by the stem cells themselves that keep these cells quiet. But essentially, what we have been able to discover over the last few years is that the way the cells are kept next to each other, the way the cells attach to each other, seem to be really important in keeping these stem cells quiet. And so, I'll tell you what I mean. So this is essentially, again, a stem cell compartment. And what you can see here are the, is that these cells are beautifully organized and they're kept very close to one another. Now, if you make perturbations in the ability of these cells to attach to each other, they can no longer stay together. And I'm just gonna show you an example of this. So on the top is a cell that's just a normal cell and it is making a contact with its neighboring cell and it keeps that contact. At the bottom is a cell where we have removed a protein that prevents these cells from sticking together and as you can see this guy cannot hold on to its neighbors. Okay, So it just keeps on changing its neighbors, keeps doing dozy does, is not able to maintain normal attachment. And so Essentially, what happens then is, if you're not able to maintain this normal junctions between cells, then this causes these cells to continuously divide, okay? So they're no longer functioning as stem cells. So these guys do not function as stem cells anymore. And of course, why is it important for us to keep a pool of stem cells that do not keep on dividing? Why do we need to save these cells? The reason for that is, if you have a gigantic wound in your, on your skin, these stem cells that are in your, these slowly dividing cells that are sitting in your hair follicles, stream out of your hair follicle and will cover your full skin and cause 
allow you to actually wound heal properly. And this is just showing that because these stem cells are labeled with a blue dye, and then when you create a wound, what you can see is that these cells are coming streaming in, and you can see that the wound is closed by these blue cells. And these are cells that are slow cycling cells that are sitting within your stem cell compartment. And you can see that the top of the skin also has these sort of blue cells, suggesting that these cells can contribute not just to the hair itself, but also to other parts of your skin. So this is what we call multipotent stem cells. And this is, this is sort of, in some sense, the promise of the future. So I'm going to just end with telling you what is the promise of stem cell therapy for treating patients by giving you a very specific example. So one of the things about skin, of course, is because it's your largest organ, but also because it is your, the, the organ that's protecting you from the external environment, any damage that happens to your skin is devastating. You have to treat it right away. Whether you have a burn, whether you have a large wound, whatever it is, you have to treat it right away, otherwise you're going to dehydrate, you're going to get infections. So you really need to protect your skin. And so generally speaking, when you have a large wound, what you can do is something uh, called an autotransplant or an autologous stem cell transplant. So you can take a small piece of your skin, you can take it to the laboratory, you can expand all the cells, come back and bring it, bring it back to you, and then you can put it on yourself. It'll fuse with your existing body, and you actually get what is called a skin graft. Okay? Now, this promise, of course, this has been done. Uh, this has been done with normal skin. But recently, we had an example on the news. This was at the end of 2017. And this was the most incredible story of this uh, nine-year-old boy from Syria who was actually escaping the violence there. He and his parents landed in Germany, but this child had a, had a horrific skin uh, disorder, a skin, genetic skin disorder. And this child's skin was completely lost because of this disorder. So literally when the doctors saw him, he had 90% of his skin gone. And this is what the, the child looked like. But he had a small patch of skin that was still existing. So what the doctors did was they took that small patch of skin, and this child had this disorder because he had a mutation in a specific gene. So what the doctors did was they took some of his cells, grew them up, reintroduced back the gene that was missing, made large patches of skin for him, and transplanted it back to him over several months. And now this child is playing football. And so this is just an incredible story. This child would have been sentenced to death, essentially, because there was no skin left on him. But with this kind of groundbreaking treatment, uh, they have been able to uh, you know, give him a new lease in life. Of course, it was very expensive. And so our job as scientists is to find ways of trying to reduce the costs and make this more accessible to the general public. And that's where I hope our research is going. And so I'll just finally end by showing you a picture of my lab at Insta. Um, none of this would be possible, none of the work that we do would be possible without a fantastic team of scientists that I have with me, both graduate students, postdocs, and technicians. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Starts available from tissue to tissue, or any tissue can be transplanted. Stem cells yeah. can be transplanted to any a tissue because uh, one may be different tissues, no? Yes. So generally speaking, every tissue and every organ in your body has its own pool of stem cells. The only stem cell that is completely multipotent is an embryonic stem cell, and therefore, what was happening now is this entire new area of research called induced pluripotent stem cells. So what, they, what you can do is you can take an adult cell and send it back into embryonic state. And those cells can then be used to differentiate into the tissue type of, that you want. And so that is certainly an area. The other type of cell that has a lot more multipotency is your bone marrow stem cells. So certainly that has been shown to contribute to other organs. Uh, but uh, to a lesser extent. But 
skin, if you want to replenish skin, you will have to start with either skin cells, skin stem cells, or induced pluripotent cells that can be differentiated into skin cells. Yeah. Uh, the most common ailment of skin is acne or pimples. So, what would be the reason that it's it's very hard to get rid of? Uh, takes years of uh, medication to get rid of. Yeah. So acne is caused because, remember I told you about the sebaceous gland, right? So the sebaceous gland gets blocked and then it gets, it, for, it, it forms a very nice environment for bacteria to thrive. And so that's what, and then that causes inflammation because the bacteria are there, your immune cells come in. And that's what causes all the redness and the pus. The pus is nothing but your immune cells fighting off. Every time you see pus, it's an immune cell that's killed off bacteria. But why does the gland It's just the structure. It's a very, it has a very small pore and unfortunately sometimes it can just get blocked. And so one of the ways that people treat it is through antibiotics really to get rid of the bacterial infection and you know just use uh, agents that reduce the amount of semen. So it also is um, associated with hormonal changes and so certainly when children are hitting puberty that's when a lot of this happens and there seems to be a response of your skin to uh, the, the sex hormones but just in terms of you know why this happens only to some people and not to others unfortunately it's just the luck of the draw that you know you just happen to have sebocytes or you know sebaceous glands that have a, a little bit of a smaller hole which can which tends to get plugged more easily. Uh, right. So cellulitis happens because uh, you produce uh, extra extracellular matrix. So this is this is you know these fibers that we need to keep our skin firm. So you must have heard of collagen, right? So collagen is a fiber that's required for skin firmness and to really keep the structure of the dermis. And sometimes what happens is you produce extra. And that again happens because the cells that you have um, are getting overactivated for some reason and they're producing a lot more of this collagen structure. And that will then cause these bumps on your skin. And again, a lot of that is also, again, hormonal. It is associated with hormone changes. Uh, my grandmother was born three months, three weeks uh, premature. She's got uh, something like uh, eczema. Is it because of that? That she was premature? So a lot of children actually have eczema. It's just something that um, it's it just something that um, children seem to have sort of more often, but I don't think it has anything to do with premature. Um, it's just that a lot of children have eczema, but it clears up once they grow get a little bit. How old is she? She's 10 now. Okay. She sweats a lot. Yeah. Both the soul and the mom. Yeah. So this is the largest concentration of sweat glands, right? Your palm, when you have your sweaty fingers, yeah. that's because your actually palms, soles, and axial region under your armpits have the most number of sweat glands. But, um, so she still has eczema? She has, yeah. yeah. And so, on the face also she has like, not very easily. Yeah. Slight dryness. Yeah. So she should just make sure that she keeps moisturizing her skin all the time. Yeah. You have to. Uh, it gets cured. It becomes. It eventually. You will eventually get to a point where this becomes less. So you, you may have fewer flare-ups, but sometimes you know. So, and she must be seeing a dermatologist. Yeah. 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 And so, so there are actually now new lines of treatment that are coming online, which uh, affect the underlying. So this is also an immune system. It's also the immune system attacking the skin. And so the question is whether we can use anti-immune therapy for some of these kind of conditions. It's a cost benefit, right? You don't want to suppress your immune system for something like a skin condition because you just don't want to have leave yourself open to infection. 
if you've had an organ transplant, yes, you want to suppress your immune system, which is it's a skin condition. So then the other thing that's happening is, in fact, a colleague of mine is doing this, is that we are actually uh, making formulations where you can give immunotherapy to specific areas. You don't have to give it globally. You can just give it to specific areas. You can uh, give medication to only to the area that's affected. And then that way you, it's not a systemic. It's not systemically given, and so I think that's also coming online now. So you see the deodorants to um, restrict uh, sweating because that's one of the major function of the skin. Yes. So people use deodorants for shoppers use. Yes. So does it harm the mm -hmm. skin? I don't think it restricts the sweating. It just neutralizes. It just neutralizes. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't actually restrict. It doesn't stop the. No, it doesn't stop the sweating. No, it just neutralizes. But anti perspirants do, I think. No, it basically just sort of that's neutralizes. That's what you Yeah, I don't think you can ever stop sweating. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, you have to have industrial strength. It doesn't block the pores. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, actually, if you have much more about autoimmune disorders now, is it anything to do with the environment or? Yeah, so there does seem to be, you know, lupus, there's a rise in lupus, there's, a, there's much more that LIGO, because rheumatoid arthritis, I think, has been around for a time in memory, right? Everybody knows somebody that has an uncle or an aunt or a parent that has RA. And, you know, it's just, and That's weather okay. like Bangalore is terrible, actually, because it's cold and the joints hurt and, you know, so, um, yes, we're living longer. And so I think certainly, uh, you know, all of these conditions are just part of, you know, uh, attrition in our joints and attrition in our, in, 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 in our general health. Uh, you know, if your immunity goes down, then it can also be that your immune system starts fighting against it. So it's already is generally something that doesn't arise. It arises more in the elderly population. No, but you, you see it even in youngsters. Yes. So we don't know why. So it's it basically the cells, you, you raise anti-nuclear antibodies in, in lupus. And so you're essentially, your body's fighting and attacking multiple sclerosis, you're actually fighting off the neuron, I mean the myelin sheath in your brain, you're trying to demyelinate it, and that causes neurological disorders. There is an increase in it. We, we, uh, there's also better diagnosis now, because we can actually call it what it is, because in the past it's like, oh yeah, this person's not feeling well, we don't know why. You know, if someone was shaky, we wouldn't know why they were shaky, but now we can go look, do an MRI and say, oh yes, this person has lesions in the brain and it's MI, um, MS. And so certainly the diagnosis has gotten better, but also, yes, the environment, the stress levels, all of that. You know, there is an hypothesis that increased stress levels cause increased autoimmune disorders. I know someone who had chikungunya and at age 22, she developed Yes, body. unfortunately, chikungunya attacks the um, joints. And it's very, very so common for young knees. people with chikungunya to undergo knee replacement. She's 29 now, but she suffers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have to undergo knee replacement because it completely destroys it. It's not just a knee, but she has aches all over. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. So we have a group. It at Insta, well not at Insta, so we at the Tata Institute of Humanity Society is trying to make flies, Aedes, Egypti that don't carry the disease anymore. So we're, so that's another part of what is happening. Sorry, there's a cure for it. There is no cure for it. We can only you can only get rid of the vector, which is the mosquitoes. So I think the diagnosis was late also. Possible. Yeah. The sweaty palm feathers was the same. So. Something can be done about it. It's good for you. I mean, it's no, but sometimes it becomes a bit too well in your mouth. You can't uh, shake hands with people or <laughs> have your feet slipper. But we're about to give a talk. <laughs> no, just, just, it's, it's, it's all good. It's your adrenaline, also, you know, your, your, you know, if I've got to check my heart rate now, I think now it's calmed down, but definitely before, yes, it was more sweaty, but that's, that's just a normal reaction. So, yeah. don't, don't sweat. <laughs> <laughs> is it really hard to find the stem cell donor, right stem cell donor? Is it because uh, there is less donors out there, or is it because the conditions to match the right stem cell is really strengthened? 
So in what context are you asking? Are you asking about you know, uh, an, um, a autologous donor? So a donor, say, for stem cells, so for bone marrow? Yeah. Yeah, so bone marrow, you have to match um, this HLAs, and that is, it, it's, it's very tricky. So not, unless you're able to match that, you're going to automatically start rejecting the tissue. Anyway, you may, go to, you may start rejecting, and you're going to have to take anti um, immunosuppressants when you get some kind of a transplant. The other problem is, and this is now we're going into social parts of this, is there are not that many people in the registry. You don't register yourself as a bone, as a stem cell donor, right? Um, and so if you don't, and if you don't, if you're not in the registry, they're not going to know that you may be a match for somebody. And so I think it's really important that if this is important, then people should make the effort to go and register themselves in these registries and say that okay, I am available if you need bone marrow for you know it could it doesn't have to be just somebody you know it could be a total stranger whose life is going to change and save. Is there a need to be hyper like uh, the donor and the receiver need to be like from the same part of the world? No, no, it's just the HLA mentioned, yeah. Okay, I think I shall leave.